My name is Katherine Coker, and I'm honored to be the Life, Les Life <coughs> Lessons Box Lunch Chair. Council for Life shines a bright light in a culture that has darkened by our brokenness. And today, we have the privilege of hearing two speakers <coughs> who are shining a, a ray of sunshine and hope, and we need that on this gloomy day. I admire them greatly for having the courage to share their own stories and personify the importance of choosing life. We'll be hearing Rebecca Kiesling and Leanda Bratomsky. You will first hear Rebecca. She is an international pro-life speaker, attorney, writer, wife, and mother of five teenagers. She is from the Detroit area and founder and president of Save the One. <coughs> Premised on her belief that she intends for every unborn child to have the same opportunity to be born, Rebecca was compelled to put a face, a voice, and a story to the issue. Rebecca's appearances include CBN's The 700 Club, Good Morning America, CNN's Talk Back Live, CBS News, and Catholic TV's This Is The Day. Please welcome Rebecca Kiesling. I'm very glad to be here today, especially since we are having record lows in Michigan right now. <laughs> uh, and this is such a beautiful event, beautiful facility. Um, you did a great job organizing this. Uh, I was adopted and raised in a Jewish family. I walk in here today and I see the uh, Museum for the Holocaust Art. Um, most of my family my adoptive family was wiped out in the Holocaust. And I grew up from a young age knowing that there's such hatred that exists in this world that people would target and kill innocent others. And it was hard to comprehend, but I grew up with that knowledge. It was actually my atheist Jewish grandmother who taught me her pro-life values. When my grandfather died, she began sharing the story that when she was pregnant with my aunt, that, who was the younger of her two children, that my grandfather had wanted her to have an abortion. She said, I never loved him again after that. And she would cry, how could they do that? How could they kill the babies? And so I had a face to the issue. That was my aunt who I adored. I couldn't imagine. Yet, my grandmother did not begin sharing that difficult story until two years after my aunt's daughter aborted my grandmother's first great-grandchild. And that's when I understand how devastating that was to her, such a betrayal for my grandmother. So it's important to be able to share these difficult stories. I know that there's a room full of people that have stories within their family um, whether they aborted or they had a child out of wedlock or what other, whatever other difficult circumstances. And it's so important to share these stories so you can pass on your pro-life values to the next generation. When I was 18, I petitioned for what's called my non-identifying information. And when it arrived, it had everything you could imagine about my birth mother except for her name. And... I thought, you know, something's wrong. Um, for my father, all it said was that he was Caucasian and of large build. And that sounds like a police description, right? So I called my caseworker and asked her, was my mom raped? And she said, yeah, I didn't want to tell you. And I was devastated. I immediately felt targeted and devalued by our society. I knew what people said. And it's been even worse since people call us demon seed, evil seed, horrible reminder, monster's child, rapist child. You never hear them say rape victim's child. I mean, that's what I am. I'm a child of a rape victim. No, we get, we get pegged as rapist child. Tainting the gene pool and uh, demon spawn and on and on. And we're systematically targeted in legislation, especially in Congress. So I knew how I was targeted, and I asked my adoptive parents, how do you feel about abortion, and what about in cases of rape? My adoptive father started to say, well, I've always felt like, 
who am I to say what a woman can or cannot do with her own body? I guess I'd have to say I've always been pro-choice. I challenged him, but Dad, you raised me 18 years. You watched me grow up. You really mean to say that you really believe that her body, her choice, was more important than my whole entire life? Really, Dad? You really believe that? And it was like he instantly snapped out of it. And he said, no, I don't believe that. Wow, how would I get to a point where I would believe such a thing? And then he started to talk about how, as a professor on a liberal campus, that it was just expected that if you were progressive-minded, you would be pro-choice. But he had never stopped to consider the ramifications of that position, particularly as an adoptive father. And so I learned at a minimum at 18 that my story had the potential to change hearts and minds, but I still struggled with big picture worldview questions of who am I, why am I here, who created me, what is my value, identity, and purpose. I ended up uh, struggling in relationships, just wanting to be loved, to prove that I was someone who was lovable and worthwhile. I excelled in academics and athletics. I went to a great law school, but I was deteriorating on the inside. And eventually, I was beat up by a boyfriend from law school who broke my jaw. I lost my front tooth. Um, I had it restored as part of the Give Back a Smile program. And so I have eight teeth with porcelain veneers. And, <laughs> uh, and I share that story because it's, it's an example, another example in my life, where there was something that happened that was really, really awful. But then something beautiful came out of it. And isn't that what God is famous for? The worst evil that man has in store, God can take and use it for good, for his glory. And there's people who would, um, you know, first of all, I'm very thankful for this nice new set of teeth, but let me make one thing clear. That does not make me pro-rape. But people actually say that to me. That, oh, so what you're saying is if abortion had been legal, you wouldn't be here today. Well, you know, if your birth mother hadn't been raped, you wouldn't be here today either. So does that mean that you're pro-rape? People actually say that to me. And I explain that I did exist and my life would have been ended through a brutal abortion. I may not look the same as I did when I was four years old or four days old, but that was undeniably me in my mother's womb. And... You know, you can be pro-firefighter and not be pro-arson, right? <laughs> we need some more critical thinking in this country. <laughs> At the time, I had really hit rock bottom when I was beat up. And from all outward appearances, I had so much going for me, but I was totally deteriorating on the inside, and that is when Christ called me back to him. And the first time I had heard the message of the gospel, I was in high school. I mean, trust me, Jesus is not a popular subject in a Jewish household. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a, a friend who invited me to hear a youth speaker who laid out the message of the gospel. And I believed, but I knew this was like an act of war in my family. I might as well have told them I had joined the Nazi party. And um, I fell away after nine months, felt betrayed by my church friends. And then after I was beat up, someone again invited me to church, shared their faith with me, and I gave my heart back over to Christ. And now today, I know my value, identity, and purpose. I know that I don't have to prove my worth to anyone, but I just have to point to the cross because that was the infinite price that was paid for my life. I wasn't worthless, but priceless. And you are too. And I hope you know your own worth. And I know that I was created by God in his image for a purpose. The rapist is not my creator, as some people would have me believe. And by the way, I was created for a good purpose because I actually had someone in my church parking lot tell me that... Um, you know, she was for abortion, and especially in cases of rape, and I asked her, well, did God not create me? 
And she stopped to think. And I was like, what are you thinking? Like, what do you, what do you need to think about? And then she says, all right, I'll give you that. <laughs> okay, you know, God and I, thank you. Wow, you know. <laughs> And then I asked her, did God not create me for a purpose? And then, again, she thought about it, and she, she actually said to me, I just think God might create some children for the purpose of being aborted. This is, this is real. This is out there. <laughs> and we need to be able to confront these kinds of, of notions, these kinds of attitudes. And I'm glad that I am able to put a face to the issue. But more than anything, I, at 18, I wanted to hear this from my own birth mother. So I petitioned, and I ended up being one of the first people in Michigan to have a judge allow my caseworker to try to contact her and see if she wanted to meet me. And it worked. I was attending college out of state. I finally received a letter with my birth name, which was Judy Ann Miracle. So I was a miracle baby. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> and it had her name, Joanne, with her phone number. So trembling, I called her up. And she said that she was expecting to hear from me. Filled me on, on the horrific details. She was abducted at knife point by a serial rapist. It was brutal. It was awful. And that's how I was conceived. That was, of course, very difficult to hear. She sent me a beautiful letter saying that this was not reason enough of having to give up something as beautiful as you were, nothing as precious as a baby. And it was this beautiful, beautiful letter. And I flew home. She had a huge family reunion for me. We spent a few days together. I flew back to college and got up the courage to ask her about abortion because I still needed to know. And she told me that if abortion had been legal in Michigan at the time, that she would have aborted me. And I said, you don't mean if you'd had to do it all over again, right? And she said, no. I said, what about everything you said in that letter? And her response was just, you don't know what it was like. It should have been my right. And I know that that's true. I don't know what it was like for her. But I know that today she's OK. She's doing great. She had a wonderful husband. She met a few years after I was born, a beautiful home. And despite the utter of horror of her saying that to me, I still chose to nurture a relationship with her, to honor her for the role that she did play in my life. And frankly, I just hoped that if I could prove myself good enough, that she'd change her mind. Well, by the time she did change her mind, six years later, I was at a really good place in my life now knowing my value, identity, and purpose in Christ where I no longer needed to hear that for my own well-being. But it was still great to hear. Two days later, Norma McCorvey, Jane Roe from Roe v. Wade, announced the very same thing to the nation, that she had changed her mind about abortion after years of having worked in an abortion clinic and having been a pro-choice activist, yet never actually having had one herself. You see, by the time her case reached the United States Supreme Court, she had given birth and placed that child for adoption. Now, I, I met her before she passed away. A couple of times I met her. How many of you here know whether Norma McCorvey, Jane Roe, had a son or a daughter in that case? She had a daughter. This is not some fictitious, theoretical, philosophical, legal entity called a fetus, but a real person, and a woman no less, who was walking the face of this earth, who was targeted for abortion in that case. We cannot let people forget that we are talking about real people, especially in the case of Roe versus Wade, in abortion clinics and pregnancy centers, real lives at stake. I have, as you heard, five children. The two oldest are adopted, and then three biological daughters. The boys have the same birth mother. We also had a baby, Cassie, who was born with a serious genetic disorder and tragically died in our arms at 33 days old. But it was an honor to take care of her. 
absolutely precious. Um, my youngest daughter, Contessa, at six and a half years old, she asked me how to spell the word conceived. Well, they, like, they know my story. They've heard me speak. And I said, why do you want to know how to spell the word conceived? She says, because I'm writing a book. It's a surprise. <laughs> so she writes this book, and she cuts it, and she sta staples it and everything. And th this is what she wrote at six and a half years old. Conceived in rape is not bad, because that's my mom. Rape is bad, and abortion is bad, because they both hurt people. Like, why can't politicians just say that? <laughs> like, you would feel the same way if that was your mother. You would want to affirm her life. Um, on my, uh, well, I'm going to tell you my Rick Perry story real quick. How much time do I have left? Like, OK. So I'm in the Citizens United film, The Gift of Life with Governor Mike Huckabee. Mine is one of several stories featured in that film. So I had backstage passes to the premiere in glamorous Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> and I, there were four presidential candidates that spoke at that event. Bachman, Santorum, Perry, and Gingrich. And so I spoke with each one of them. I introduced myself, told them I'm in tonight's film, that I'm the national spokeswoman for personhood. Right away, Bachman and Santorum said, oh, I signed the personhood pledge. I said, yes, I know. Thank you so much. It was a no exceptions, no compromise pledge for presidents, came out, or presidential candidates came out two days before. They both signed it right away. Perry and Gingrich had not signed it because they were both rape exception candidates. And so I hand them my DVDs, Conceived and Rape from Worthless to Priceless, and our group DVD, Accepting Cases of Rape, 12 Stories of Survival. And right away, Governor Perry was stunned. Oh, and, and I gave him my business card, Conceived and Rape Targeted for Abortion. You know, subtle. <laughs> <laughs> and so... He's holding these DVDs and he says, this is your story? And I shared with him some of what I shared with you, how I was conceived and almost aborted. And then he, he says, can I have your autograph? Oh. I said, no. He says, no, I mean it here, make it out to my daughter. So I wrote 100% pro-life, Rebecca Kiesling. <laughs> And then he asked me more questions, and I told him some, what I've, some of what I do, how I have a global organization of, now it's over 600 of us, conceived and raped, mothers from rape, and hundreds who were told by doctors to abort, how I mentor others to do speaking, and, um, and how, as an attorney, I've litigated numerous high-profile cases nationally, uh, defending human life, also now terminating the parental rights of rapists. And he said to me, you know, you're my heroine. Wow, thank you so much. But it's funny you say that. Because my question for you is, would you be my hero? And I shared with him how I was almost killed at two illegal abortions. And how my mother was pro-choice when we met. And I literally owe my birth to legislators who protected me. Four years before Roe v. Wade, I was born exactly three and a half years to the date of Roe v. Wade, 10 months after the trial date in Texas. I wasn't lucky. I was protected. And those legislators are my heroes. And so I asked him, would you be my hero too? And he said, yes, yes, I, I would. But you make that rape exception. And he put his head down. He was shaking his head and saying, oh, wow, this is so powerful. This is so powerful. And he was thinking about it. <laughs> I didn't know how much time I'd have with him. And all the people were waiting. So I told him, I want to get my photo taken with you, but my battery's dead. And he said, well, I have my own personal photographer. Come with me. That was my like best Rick Perry impersonation, by the way. Um, <laughs> so 
we went to his green room and he took a ton of photos, which he never sent me. <laughs> he, he actually used um, a photo of me, him, and Huckabee like in an ad campaign. So there's like a little clip there. But um, so he kept looking at the camera saying, I just can't imagine. I just can't imagine. And I looked up at him and I explained that when you make that rape exception, that's like saying to me that I deserved the death penalty for the crime of my biological father. The United States Supreme Court said that he didn't even deserve the death penalty. In the first case, Coker v. Georgia, they said that it's cruel and unusual punishment. And in the second case, Kennedy v. Louisiana, they said that even for child molesters, they don't deserve the death penalty. And he was nodding his head. And then I asked him, but you believe that I, the innocent child, deserve the death penalty? And he said, no, no, I, I don't. And I'm like, well. <laughs> and he stopped me. And he said, you know, tonight's event and this film are supposed to be all about changing hearts and minds. And right now, you're changing my heart. <laughs> I thought, hmm, changing? Like, what's that supposed to mean? And I had all kinds of friends on Facebook telling me that they were praying for me, saying, you're going to have an Esther moment. I just know it for such a time as this. And I was not about to miss it. <laughs> perspective of someone like me. I mean, he was the governor of Texas running for president. You think he's never heard the arguments before? But it goes to show what faces, voices, and stories can do to pierce the heart in ways in which arguments cannot. The next morning, he signed the personhood pledge, and so did Newt Gingrich. And he went on national television over the next several weeks, four times, talking about our conversation, saying that my story pierced his heart, and that he could not look me in the eyes and justify the rape exception any longer. And, uh, you know, he's my hero. I mean, he could easily have been beat up. I mean, you saw the way that Todd Aiken and Richard Murdoch were treated, and they just manipulated Richard Murdoch's words. And Rick Santorum was attacked for saying that he still thinks the child's a gift from God, and they're saying, oh, you know, if you've been raped, that's your gift. And they, but I tell you what, with Governor Perry, they gave him a pass because they knew that there was a story of a real woman attached to this, and they wanted to let it go. <laughs> they don't want to talk about real people. And so they gave him a pass. Uh, did some of you see the recent news, what's going on in New York? OK. I did a video on Facebook. It's like, I don't know, 42,000 views this morning. Um, explaining, a, a, a lot of people are saying, oh, it's fake news. They wouldn't really do that. They're not legalizing abortion through all nine months for any reason. And a lot of people don't know how to respond to this. And um, even people were taking screenshots of the bill saying, look, there's all this protection for unborn baby. They don't understand that everything in the brackets is what's been removed from the law and whole sections have been removed for law. And then people were like giving a link to Snopes. And Snopes, you know, they dispel urgent, or urban legends, right? And they were saying it's partially true. But they showed, there's a section where it said one of the things that did was that they removed this issue from the criminal code. Well, what that means is that they completely decriminalized abortion. And for those of you who don't know what that word means, they made it legal, okay? For any reason, through all nine months of pregnancy, not health or life, any reason, through birth, they removed the parental consent, which means you can, that they could take your daughter in New York, to, or the sex trafficker, okay, or child molester can take a girl to get an abortion and get away with it and not even a parental notification that this is happening. 
And believe me, rapists, child molesters, and sex traffickers love abortion. The abortion clinic is their best friend. They destroy the evidence and it allows and enables them to continue perpetrating. Um, and then, I don't know if you guys saw the video of what just happened, uh, what was said in Virginia yesterday. Her name is Kathy Tran. She's a legislator from Virginia, a delegate, which is like a state representative. And she put forth the same bill. They're introducing this all over the country now. This is the model legislation from NARAL, National Abortion Rights Action League. It's to get rid of all pro-life protections at all, and even um, fetal homicide. They're removing it from the law. So you could be, you could choose life, be on your way to deliver your baby at the hospital and somebody kills you and there's no homicide for that. And so she was testifying and this other, the chairman of the committee did a great job, Gilbert, and he said, so let me make this clear. So for mental health reasons, which by the way, you don't need a doctor who has expertise in mental health, just as long as the doctor who's doing the abortion determines that this is good for her mental health. Um, in labor, dilated. Are you saying, does your bill allow this? And she said, yes, my bill allows this. In labor, dilated. This is what we're facing. This is all happening all over the country. They're also suing states that have a pro-life legislature, but they have a liberal judiciary. And like in Iowa, where they had passed the heartbeat bill, they found a right to an abortion under the state constitution. Same thing, North Dakota, a very red state, but the problem is the judiciary is not. And they found to a, a right to an abortion on the state constitution. So even if Roe v. Wade's overturned, um, there's only gonna be a handful of states where unborn children are protected. So we've got our battle laid out for us. Um, I'm an attorney, so I just I, I write about this subject a lot. This is, it means everything to me. Um, you know, it's not a philosophical discussion. This is my life. And the most selfish thing I could do would be to just live my life and say, oh, well, I deserved it. And others didn't. No, oh, I can't do that. And I know that that's why you're here too. Because you could just say, well, I've got a great life, at least I'm alive, you know, just live comfortably and not care about the others. I feel like my life was spared from a burning building. And as I have the opportunity to go back and save others, I'm gonna do it. And what do we have to risk? It's not like we're actually running into a burning building. You know, what do we have, a little bit of scorn? You know, that's it. We need to go back and save the others. And uh, one last story I'll share with you. <sighs> On my birthday a few years ago, my birth mother called to wish me happy birthday and to tell me that my grandmother had died. Um, I was born on her wedding anniversary and she died on my birthday. And my birth mother was a little sad to hear that I was in Massachusetts. I had just arrived the night before visiting my in-laws. My husband's a fifth of seven, and so we have to go back there. I don't know how they live there, honestly. You know, <laughs> like living in New York, I just, ugh. Uh, but I told her, look, I'm going to be there for you. Don't worry, I'm going to fly home. I'm going to be there for you. We have a very close mother-daughter relationship. And we had a long heart-to-heart -heart reminiscing. And both of us had been to visit my grandmother just a couple of weeks earlier. My grandmother was in a nursing home, and she wasn't looking up or smiling. And not only did I get her to look up and smile, but I got her to laugh because I sang to her. And if you heard me sing, you would laugh too. <laughs> not good. And at the end of this long discussion, I was, we were about to hang up, and my birth mother stopped me. And she said, Rebecca, Rebecca, I just want to say, I'm so glad I had you. Like, oh. 
That was the best birthday gift ever. Decades after she had sought to end my life, two decades after she had been telling me it should have been my right, she was able to speak those words to me. And just know that when you get involved, when you're an advocate, or if you're volunteering with the Pregnancy Center, or 40 Days for Life, or however you might be involved in the community, There will one day be mothers in your community who will one day be able to say to their children, I'm so glad I had you. Thank you. Okay, I am going to introduce Leandria who used to be Leandria Murray, and she is now Leandria Vitomsky. And Leandria and I met when I spoke at her university um, in my hometown, five minutes from me, and she um, happened to come in and she starts to tell me her story. And I was just absolutely so moved. Like, this is a really powerful story. Like, I knew she was a communications major, had her own TV show, radio show. I'm like, you need to be speaking. And so I've mentored her and some other people in our area. The local pregnancy center director took her under his wings, um, got her speaking at uh, Right to Life of Michigan's annual conference. And out of that, there was one spring, she had 13 fundraisers for Right to Life of Michigan. They have funders. She's a phenomenal speaker. Um, our local pregnancy center, they had like 900 at their banquet. They had her as a keynote. Um, and she became really well known in Michigan and then she moved to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and she lives in the Dallas area. And so when I was invited to speak here, I just said, can we have another speaker too? Because <laughs> People in, in Texas need to know her. She needs to be speaking all over the place because she is gifted, beautiful young woman, and um, she feels a calling to be doing this full time. And so I hope that after this, y'all will <laughs> introduce her. <laughs> all right, so please welcome Leandria Ratowski. She just had a baby eight months ago. I did. So I have, I make it my personal mission whenever uh, family members come to Texas from Michigan, I try to get them to love it so that they can move here. So we've already gotten Rebecca on board because she said y'all, y'all heard it, right? <laughs> so give it a couple more months and she'll be down here for good, okay? Uh, but no, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity to stand in front of all of y'all and uh, tell my story. I'm a native, you get it? It just rolls right off the tongue. Um, but uh, thank you again. So uh, my pro-life story started 10 years ago, actually, when I was a senior in high school. And my teacher had given us an assignment. And she said, you guys are about to go off to college. It's time to clean up your social media because college recruiters and they're all looking at those social media pages, she said. So I want you all to Google yourself and see what you find on the internet. And I'm like, Google myself? I mean, okay, whatever. So I go home that night and I type in Leandria Murray. And the first thing that pops up on the Google page says, do you mean Alexandria? Because with a name like Leandria, it's so unusual. And I'm like, no, I, I mean Leandria. So I'm scrolling through pages and pages of things that aren't related to me. And finally, I land on a page and I see my name highlighted. I see my mother's name highlighted and I see my grandmother's name. So I'm thinking, hmm, this is an article. This is interesting. This is an article that was published in a local newspaper in Detroit, the Detroit News. Um, so I click on the article, and what I found changed my life forever. This article goes on to explain exactly how I was conceived. My mother was 13 years old when I was conceived. 
and she was actually in a relationship with my father who was 17. I was, my mother was 14 when I was actually born. So in the state of Michigan, legally, it was statutory rape, but it was a consensual relationship between my parents. When my mom found out that she was pregnant with me, she told my grandmother, and immediately, without hesitation, my grandmother said to my mom, you're having an abortion. She says, you're 13 years old, you live in my house, I'm already low income, receiving government assistance, and I'm pregnant. My grandmother told my mom, you cannot have this baby. It's your baby or mine, and I'm choosing my baby. The very next day, my grandmother drove my mother to the local abortion clinic. And my mom says that she knew exactly what was about to happen. She tells me that she was terrified about the decision that she was forced to make. But she knew that if she got out of that car and she told my grandmother that she didn't want to do it, she knew that my grandmother would have some serious consequences. My grandmother had already told her, if you decide to have this baby, I'm kicking you out. I can't do it. So she walks my mom into the clinic. And as my mother walks back to the room, about to have the very procedure to end my life, she tells me that she knows in her heart that what she's about to do is wrong. She sits on the table, and when the abortion doctor walks in, my mom told me, she said, I just couldn't do it. I could not make the decision to end your life. And it was in that moment that she got up off of that table, and she walked out. And that was the day, the very day, that she made the best decision ever. Because, I mean, I'm here. Look at me. <laughs> Yeah. So as she walks out the room, she sees my grandmother. And my grandmother goes, OK, did, did you take care of your business? Did you do what I told you to do? And my mom says, no, I couldn't do it. I heard her heartbeat, and I couldn't do it. And my grandmother says, well, I told you that if you did not have that abortion, that you were out of my house. So you got to get your stuff, and you got to get out. 14 years old, excuse me, 13 years old at that time. Nowhere to go, no help. And my mom says, she says, I knew that I was facing a long road, and I didn't know my fate. But the one thing that I knew in my heart was that my baby deserved a fighting chance at life. So blessed, I'm so blessed that my mom had that mentality. Because legally, my life was not protected. I wasn't protected by the law like Rebecca was. I didn't have anybody fighting for me. The only person that valued my life was my 13-year-old mother. When I think back about it, uh, think back on it, not only did she have so much strength, but the way that my mom raised me was the same, she had that same strength throughout my whole entire life. She's always instilled in me to be a strong woman. She's always told me that no matter what circumstance I'm in, I can overcome. And then I am put here for greater and that God has a plan for me. And that's why I do what I do today. I go all over the country and I speak to rooms full of people just like yourselves. People who believe that every life should be protected. And I even speak to rooms full of people who believe that every woman has a choice and that she should have the right. And when I go to these places and I speak to these people, my one mission 
is to change their hearts. Because I know that if, we can, if I can change their hearts, then we can all work together to change the world. Funny story, one year, it was Mother's Day. And I wanted to do something so special for my mom because she's been through so much with me. So I said, Mom, it's Mother's Day. I'm working now out of college. I'm going to take you to dinner. Where would you like to go? And I was expecting my mom to give me all these fancy suggestions. Now, mind you, we're not from Dallas, so it's not like my mom was like, you know, take me to Nick and Sam's or, you know, somewhere amazing. Um, we're from Michigan, so my mom's like, well, why don't you take me to Red Lobster? And I'm like, no, girl, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> we're not going to Red Lobster, sorry. Um, so she's like, well, why don't you take me to, it was some crazy stuff, she, Applebee's. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I'm paying, pick somewhere nice. So after we're going through all these suggestions of places, finally I said, you know what? Why don't we go to that little restaurant that we used to go to all of the time? You know, the one right off of the water on Jefferson? And my mom says to me, she says, no, what restaurant are you talking about? And I said, you remember? We would go there all of the time. There was such a nice greeter when we walked in. That lady, her name was Miss Hattie. And my mom is thinking. I said, you remember we used to have the best seat in the restaurant right by the kitchen. Why I thought that was the best seat in the restaurant, I don't know, but whatever. <laughs> and I'm just saying, you remember we used to go there all the time and there was such a nice guy, Mr. Jim, he would always bring us our food. And my mom said, Leanne, that wasn't a restaurant. That was a soup kitchen. It was at that moment that I realized how far God has brought us. And I say, I tell this story to say, we struggled. We were poor. We were homeless. But my mother was determined to make a better situation for the both of us. I know a lot of you are probably thinking, well, how did she overcome? She stood firm. Even though we were homeless, my mother stayed in school. She enrolled in a, a school for pregnant teens, and she had amazing support from her teachers to guidance counselors, even to the principal of that school. You all have heard the, the uh, saying, it takes a village to raise a child. Her village was so strong and to this day, I'm forever grateful to each and every one of the staff members at that school. They helped my mother to find housing for us. They helped her to get her first job. And they were so proud of the person that my mother had become that they were the ones who contacted the newspaper. And that's how the article was written. I just found that out yesterday, by the way. So that's why I'm like looking at Rebecca, because she asked me that they contacted the newspaper. They did a spotlight on my mother and um, came and interviewed her. And they were just very, very proud of how she overcame everything. I remember being at my mom's high school graduation, one of my earliest mem memories. And she actually got me like a little cap and a gown. I was really cute, you should see the pictures. Totally cute. Um, but I remember, being at the graduation, and I just remember the look on my mother's face. She was beaming, beaming. She had done it. She had defied all the odds. She graduated. She got that piece of paper. And even though she didn't move on to college right away, she got a really good job, making great money. And she was now able to provide for us. My mother worked that job she worked at Wonder Bread Hostess, um, and she worked that job for, I believe, 16, 14 to 15 years, all the way until they closed their doors when they recently got bought out by Bimbo Bakery. But I say all of that to say, when I talk to my mom, she still has that same beam of pride 
when she looks at me and she sees everything that I've accomplished, she is glowing even more. And when she looks at my son, oh, I mean, she's like, I did that. That's my grandson. <laughs> I mean, he is pretty cute. Look at his mama, you know. But it's just such a blessing. Even when I look at my son to this day, I can't imagine living in a world without him. And I've only had him for eight months. But I can't imagine living without him. And I know that that's the same exact way that my mom feels. Unfortunately, my mom didn't have a pregnancy resource center where she could go and she could receive things that she needed. But that's why I find it so important to donate, to spend time inside of pregnancy resource centers because they are allowing young women to get the help that they need, the resources that they need, the counseling that they need, so that they know that they can do it. I am the baby that was conceived to a 13-year-old mother born into poverty. And I stand here today as a college graduate, working, living, and thriving. It can happen. It can happen. I am living proof. And that's exactly why I do what I do. Thank you so much. for attending and uh, just another round of applause for these amazing stories of redemption.